In the previous couple of videos on uh, filtering, we've gone through basic building blocks and we've also gone through how to visualize filter responses and how to build some filters um, from scratch, some simple filters. So now we can put all that together to address some real world scenarios. And the example we use today is crossover filters. Crossover filters are often thought of in the context of loudspeaker design, but they're also very useful if you wanted to do something like create a uh, multi-band compressor or um, split bands up for a granular synthesis process. So uh, what are the concerns for uh, crossover filters and how are we going to construct a crossover filter? Well, first thing we need to do is we need to think about what the filter responses are like. If we go to a filter design object, this will get us a good place to start. We can look at different filter topologies. So as an example, uh, here's a Chebyshev 2 filter topology and filter design offers a couple of others including a Chebyshev 1 and a Butterworth. Really what we want to do if we're doing a crossover filter, uh, Chebyshev 1 won't work because we want a perfectly flat pass band with no distortion in it. And a Chebyshev 2 won't work because we want to completely cut out the frequencies in the stop band. So that leaves us with a Butterworth filter. So let's start with a Butterworth filter. So let's create our filter design object to create this filter. We know we want the topology to be Butterworth. And we know that we want this to do a crossover. We're going to need a low pass filter paired with a high pass filter. So we'll make two of these. Then we can go ahead and grab a couple of adder UI objects so that we can control the frequency where we want the crossover to occur. And we're also going to want to control the order of the filter so that we can see how much roll off there is, for example. And I'll go ahead and just, we'll start with a second order filter, which is something that you could implement using a biquad object, which is convenient. And for the frequency, I'm going to make the frequency um, just something kind of in the middle of the band. Okay, so in order to see what these filter uh, responses are going to look like. We need to use the pair of objects that we've been using in other videos, which is a filter detail object. And we're going to pair that up with a plot object. And we'll need to do this for each of these two, though they can share a plot object. I've already set up a plot object, so I'll just paste that in here. Hook up the frequency um, I should say the magnitude response for these. We've plotted normalized frequency. Uh, the normalized frequency meaning that uh, one is going to be our Nyquist frequency in this case. Okay, so now that we've done that and we can go ahead here and Voila, we have this high pass filter is being plotted by the yellow line. We have a blue line, which is plotting this low pass. And um, right now we have a red line, but we haven't actually um, connected anything to this inlet. So it's just set at zero. So now we need to figure out how do we evaluate what happens when you combine these two filters together. Ideally what happens is that our band is split into a low frequency part and a high frequency part, we have separate outlets or two separate filters that provide those. But then if we combine those two signals back together, we want a faithful reproduction as if there was no filter ever there. So how do we visualize the combined frequency response of these two filters? So I'm going to take a step back and we're going to talk about another way of looking at the filter output. Namely, 
uh, we want to see what the impulse response of a filter is. Any filter can be described by its impulse response. A uh, fur filter, meaning one just with feed forward, can be perfectly described with its impulse response. An infinite impulse uh, response filter, one with feedback, can't be perfectly described, but it can be described pretty well if you have enough points. So if I hit this bang here, we can see that this uh, filter right here has this impulse response, and that can describe that filter. So if we take this and made it into a fur filter description, we would have an approximation of what this Butterworth filter is doing. Let's take a look at that real quick. I'm going to copy and paste a little patcher here. This is based on one that we did in a previous video. What we have here is we have, we're making a dictionary. The dictionary is going to describe a filter. The denominator is basically going to be nothing because we only have feed forward in this case. And what we need to do is we need to take this impulse response the ZL length thing is going to fill out that denominator, which is going to be a 1 and a bunch of zeros. Then we're going to use the actual, this actual impulse response, and that's going to be hooked up as the numerator. And then we can bang the thing to produce it. And what we'll see is we're going to see a filter, which is almost exactly what this filter is. We're seeing more range here, so the shape's slightly different, but we get the idea. So, using that impulse response, we were able to see an approximation of that filter. And if we do this again for the other filter, you'll again see this impulse response. Doom, doom, doom. Produce this filter. Well, with those tools, we can combine the impulse responses to see what the combined filters will produce. The way we'll do that is we'll take those uh, uh, two impulse responses, which are just lists, we'll use the Vexper object. The Vexper object will allow us to take two lists and we'll add them in piecewise manner. So now, what we can do is get rid of these and clean this up. We're going to take this impulse response and this impulse response. It'll produce a combined impulse response right here. Get rid of all of that. Okay, and then let's hook this magnitude response up here. So it should be shown on the red now. Okay, and now when we hit the bang, we can now see the combined filter response. And in fact, this combined filter response looks pretty surprising. It's not at all what we expect. We see this filter and it's combined with this filter, we wouldn't expect that in the middle where these two are crossing over that the sound's going to drop out to negative infinity. So there's got to be more going on here than what we can actually see. We can also change the order of the filter to see how what happens. And we see when we change it to a third order, now it's flat across the top. Change it to a fourth order, now we have a plus 3 dB bump at the crossover. So let's go back and try and figure out what's going on here. Why is it that this is dropping out? And why do these responses behave differently? If we were to take a look at the phase response of the filter, we're going to see that the yellow filter, which is the high pass, is 180 degrees out of phase the whole way across from the blue filter, which is our low pass. So when the two of those combine and they're out of phase, then it cancels all the signal out. That is definitely not what we want in a crossover filter. So 
what can we do about that? Well, one thing we could do is we could flip the phase of one of those signals. So, if, for example, if we took another Vexper object and we said we're going to take all the input, we're going to multiply it by negative 1 to flip the phase. Um, to multiply negative 1 against all of those, we'll go ahead and put this in scalar mode. And then hook this up to this here. So now we've flipped the phase of one of those. And if we flip the phase, then what we'll see is that it's not um, canceling out in the middle. In fact, now we have a 3 dB bump in the middle. So that's one solution to that problem. And sometimes people do that. That's a, um, if you only want a second order of filter, that is one solution to the problem. Back to this, if we switch to third order Butterworth filters, what we can see is that it's flat across the top. The two signals are 90 degrees out of phase with each other all the way through. So it's not nearly as objectionable as having the two signals be 180 degrees out of phase. This still isn't ideal, but um, it's a lot better and in fact, if you were to look at the cross object in Max, cross, C-R-O-S-S, -S, tilde, this is a crossover filter that internally is a pair of third order Butterworth filters. So this models that experience precisely. If we go to a fourth order filter, which will give us a steeper roll off on those two filters, we can see down at the bottom now that both signals are perfectly in phase with each other. And that is what we'd really like to have. Unfortunately, it results in this 3 dB bump at the top. So what do we do about that? Well, there's a variation on the Butterworth filter. And if we go looking through the literature, um, either through searching through um, Audio Engineering Society journals or um, online, we can see that we come up with something called a Linkwitz-Riley crossover. And this particular article, um, which is a RAIN tech note, is um, particularly um, helpful in this case. And this Linkwitz-Riley uh, can be made in a couple of ways, which are described in this article. One of them is by cascading a couple of Butterworth filters. There's another way to come up with the coefficients for this filter, and that was uh, described in a Texas Instruments uh, article that is no longer online. However, uh, Tron Losius um, created some Linkwitz Riley filters in the Jamoma project, and so we can see how these calculations are done to calculate coefficients here. So taking that information, let's see if we can make a Linkwitz-Riley filter and compare it to what we see over here with these Butterworth filters. I'll just scoot this here out of the way a little bit. I'm going to paste in a patcher here that I have pre-baked. And what this patcher is going to do is instead of using the filter design object to come up with the coefficients for our filter, I have a JavaScript here, and the JavaScript will calculate those coefficients. So if I double click on here, we can see I've taken all of the code from Tron's C++ file, translated it into JavaScript, and having done that, I'll go ahead and plug in the same filter coefficients, and this is a fourth order Linkwitz Riley filter. What do we have now? Well, we have the same flat passband from the, each of the two individual filters, the combined response now is perfectly flat, which is awesome. And the phase response is 360 degrees different, which is to say that it's in phase. So this is fabulous, and this is exactly what we want. This fourth order link which Riley has really become the standard for crossover filters to implement this filter so that we can actually apply it to our audio, we're going to need a fourth order filter that will take our coefficients. The biquad in Max is a second order filter, and we could do some work to split this into two 
by quads. Uh, but instead what we'll do this time is we'll make a fourth order filter and then we can use that with our coefficients to filter the audio. So we'll get rid of the old Butterworth versions. We'll pull this stuff over here for our Linkwitz Riley. And then we can go ahead and get started with working on our gen. Now I'm going to go ahead and cheat on this one as well. So here's my gen object. And what I've done inside this gen object is I've constructed the fourth order filter. We have an input and an output. And then we have five coefficients on the feed forward side of the filter. We have four coefficients on the feedback side of the filter. This first coefficient is applied. It's the gain coefficient to the input. And then we have one sample of delay. Each sample of delay is then delayed again. So we have four samples of delay at the highest. And we apply a coefficient, meaning just we multiply a number by it. These all get summed together. Then on the feedback side, we've taken the output of our filter. We delay it by a sample, apply a coefficient, delay by another sample, apply a coefficient, etc. Those all get summed together and are subtracted from the other side of the filter. And this is our fourth order filter. This is just a larger version of those first order filters we did in the previous filter tutorial. So this is a general fourth order filter. We're going to need one for the low pass side and one for the high pass side. We'll need to have an, a way to hear what we're doing if we care about that. We'll need some sort of source, sound source. Noise will work well for the moment. Hook those guys up like that. If we want to see it, we could hook up a plot object with some FFTs on them. So let's go ahead and drop in a plot object set up as it would be in the plot help file. We throw on a windowed FFT. And now we just have to set the coefficients for these filters. So to do that, we need to get the coefficients that are coming out of our JavaScript. If we look again at the JavaScript, we can see that outlet zero is sending these feed forward coefficients. Outlet one is sending the feedback coefficients. And then we have the high pass coefficients out the next two outlets. I'm going to go ahead and use the unjoin object. If you're more familiar with unpack, unjoin is like unpack, except you don't have to type individual arguments for each outlet. You can just say, I want five things to come out of my list. So for the low pass filter, feed forward coefficients, we can just say unjoin five and hook these straight up. Okay, and then for the feed back coefficients, we will also do an unjoin five, because there are five elements in there. Let's stick this guy down here out of the way. Um, however, when we get those coefficients, we will ignore the first one, which is always a one. If you remember in the biquad, the convention is to do the same. Okay, so there we have it. And then we're going to do the same thing again over here for the high pass side of the filter. One, two, three, four, five. And then get our four feedback coefficients pushed in here. And then hook these up to our JavaScript get the coefficients. So it should be, if we've done everything right now, we turn it on and here at 8K, we see a nice little crossover. I hope this has been helpful. We can see why we're using certain filter in this case by evaluating the characteristics of the filter. And in the end, we built a filter that Max doesn't have in order to have 
a really nice sounding crossover that we can use for anything from multiband compressors to more creative applications. Along the way we got to experience the impact of the phase response of filters when you combine them, which is an aspect of filtering that sometimes we don't pay enough attention to. Happy patching!